Logic as we know it today did not have the same name or look like it did in the early 90s. At first, it was named Notator Logic and was created by the German software company eMagic in 1993. During this time, it wasn't really a DAW yet, it was more of a music sequencer and score writing program. However, for the time it was certainly one of the most widely used and feature heavy music programs out there. Remember, this is before even the year 2000. The iPhone was still a decade away from being made, Bill Clinton was still president, and Netscape was the most popular browser. I bet most of you don't even know what Netscape is, that's how old this sequencer was. Even so, it was absurdly powerful for what it was during the 90s. Even weirder than that, this program was one of the first to be accessible only through a dongle attachment via USB. All Notator programs were ran through this piece of hardware to be accessible on Mac, Windows, and Atari ST devices. When you purchased Notator Logic, you would plug another piece of hardware called the Log3 into your dongle to access it. The Log3 had three MIDI out ports for you to export your songs through. The 90s were fucking weird, man. Early on, the layout of Notator Logic was similar to that of Cubase in the way that it arranged your sequences. Think of Notator Logic as a program that sorts Legos. Sequences are the smallest Lego, and you can build upon them and stack them or chain them together to create more complicated sequences until your arrangement completes a full song. You can also store multiple sequences into a folder to make them easier to arrange. Then you can chain together your folders in the arrangement window, at which point you can view your folders and sequences in a tree display. This was extremely effective for music production, and versions of this type of arrangement are still used in modern DAWs. This system was much different than the track and pattern-based approach that Logic and other DAWs like FL Studio use. On top of all this, you could theoretically work through multiple windows at once, because windows could be stacked and arranged in a multi-view mode. However, this was the 90s still, and it didn't work very well on a 12-inch monitor, but the idea was still there for future DAWs to build on. They had a parameter box that you could quantize, transpose, adjust velocity, dynamics, length, and delay of all of your sounds. All of these effects would be applied dynamically during playback, so the original signal wasn't altered. This was very important for the time, because computers were horrendously slow, and applying and undoing effects like this to hear the difference was excruciatingly painful and slow to do. Nowadays with powerful tools like Ableton's complex algorithm for transposing and stretching, this doesn't matter as much since computers are so much faster. It just goes to show how creative people needed to get when the hardware was the main limitation on software. I think the most overlooked feature in Notator Logic is the score editor. This window allows you to open score sheets in an event window. You can edit individual events that will change the score sheet from the event window. This essentially boils down music to its most basic form, a long list of events that happen in order at a specific time. It's sort of like a visual representation of how computer code runs, top to bottom and one command at a time. Now of course, you can have multiple score sheets for different instruments that will be playing simultaneously, but it's very novel to be able to look at your music in its most stripped down, computerized form. Notator Logic was fucking cool. During research for this video, I spent an absurd amount of time reading about this program and its history, far more than I'm actually including in this video for the sake of brevity. I'm going to include some resources in the description if you want to do some in-depth reading yourself. I highly recommend it if you're interested in the history of older programs and hardware. Anyways, sooner rather than later, Notator Logic would be a thing of the past. It's no surprise that Apple took interest in Notator Logic and purchased it from eMagic in 2002. They were so interested in fact, they acquired eMagic itself. At this time, the program had already dropped the Notator from the name, and Apple renamed it to Logic Pro. Since I'm going to say Logic Pro an absurd number of times in this video, from now on I'm just going to refer to it as Logic. Due to the time being the early 2000s, it was still common to see boxed versions of software via CD. This was the main way to purchase Logic, however only 9 years later the box version would be discontinued and you'd only be able to purchase Logic through the Mac App Store. Apple being Apple, decided to also discontinue development for the Windows platform and have Logic be an Apple exclusive product. This announcement caused much uproar in the recording industry because an estimated 70,000 users of Logic were using Windows and did not want to invest time or money into a new program. However, Apple provided a free alternative to Logic in 2004 called GarageBand, which used a Logic audio engine. This program was quickly written off as just a low-powered toy rather than a music production suite. However, looking back and at the current version of GarageBand, this couldn't be further from the truth. 
GarageBand may look uninvolved, but it's wildly capable of creating professional sounding music. From a first look, it may seem like just a stripped down version of Logic, which it may be, but it has enough packed into it that even a newcomer would probably struggle to grasp how to use it for a while. Its main limitation was how few tracks you could be playing simultaneously, but producers always triumph in the face of technical limitations. I mean, just look at the music software industry. It's filled with piracy, workarounds, gray area tutorials, and smart people looking for clever solutions to their problems. The solution around having a limited number of tracks was fairly straightforward. Just combine multiple tracks into a single WAV file and you suddenly have as many tracks as you want. However, you are no longer able to edit those individual tracks that were bounced as a combined WAV, but still was a usable workaround. Anyways, Logic 6, the newest version at the time for Mac only, as it had dropped Windows support by this version, was a very capable music production suite. Released in March of 2004, Apple consolidated over 20 different eMagic products into a single product. This included every instrument and effect VST that eMagic had, WaveBurner Pro, which was a CD authoring app, and Pro Tools support. At this time, Apple decided to follow suit with FL Studio's model of offering different versions of Logic to cater to different consumers. Logic Gold and Silver were replaced with Logic Express, a more stripped down version of Logic. At this time, Apple was fully invested in making Logic a flagship product in their software line for Macs. That vision would most certainly be realized in the future. Nearing the end of 2004, Apple released Logic 7. This was a complete visual overhaul, and they dropped the eMagic aesthetic in favor of an interface that more closely resembled the Apple visual brand. When you see an Apple device's user interface, it's immediately apparent that it's an Apple product. Logic 7 was no different here. However, Logic 7 did keep most of the interface components in a relatively similar place as previous versions as to not be too jarring of a change. Most notably though, this version integrated Apple Loops and DAP, distributed audio processing, which allowed multiple computers on the same network to combine their computing power on a single project. On top of that, three new instruments including Sculpture and Ultrabeat were added. Sculpture was a modeling synthesizer, and Ultrabeat was a drum synthesizer and sequencer. Instruments weren't the only thing added though. Nine effect VSTs were included as well, including probably one of the most famous of all, Guitar Amp Pro, which was a guitar amp simulator. During this time period of Logic's development, the interface would not change too dramatically. There was one change though, and that was the global track display. It allowed users to more easily adjust the time signature, tempo, and key markers throughout the track. Apple was much more focused on making it faster, user-friendly, and a smoother experience to use. After all, Apple's philosophy explained by Johnny Ive was, our devices should be an extension of yourself, just like your hand. This rang true with all Apple hardware and software and did not exclude Logic. If all that wasn't enough, importing GarageBand projects was now possible in Logic 7, so if you started out in GarageBand and worked your way up to using a more intimidating program like Logic, you could work on your previous projects. This is something that I think other programs sorely need. FL Studio does work with FL Mobile projects, but not natively. There's somewhat of an annoying process of zipping up samples and custom instruments into the mobile version and extracting that onto your PC instead of just having projects on mobile saved in a cloud and being able to instantly import to desktop. Anyways, things like that make me appreciate Apple more. There are plenty of things to complain about when it comes to Apple products, but ease of use is definitely not one of them. Three years later, on September 12th of 2007, Logic 8 came out. Delay Designer was added as a plugin to Logic 8. Now, I'm mostly an FL Studio user, but good god do plugins like this make me wish I used other DAWs more frequently. Delay Designer is the definitive stock delay plugin Logic offers. This thing is fucking cool. It lays out its usefulness front and center by giving you five different tabs to work with that all use the same graph-like visualization for each parameter. It allows you to edit the parameters of individual repeats from delays it generates. For example, if you wanted your delay to slowly dip downward in pitch, you can use the transpose graph and make each delay point lower and lower like a staircase. I don't think I've ever seen a delay plugin with this much control over its output that is so accessible before. This is the type of thing Apple is known for, and things like this are why people use Logic. They create tools that are not only functional, but visually appealing and intuitive, so they don't feel like tools. They feel like just an extension of what we know how to do. Anyways, enough rambling about that. Logic 8 also consolidated much of what 7 had to offer in a single window for ease of use. By this time, I think it's safe to say that Logic was a true professional competitor to most of its peers, such as Ableton, FL, or Cubase. The last version to be released with a number after the title was Logic 9 on July 23rd, 2009. 
It included one of the most important updates yet, flex time. This was Apple's version of stretching and quantization for WAV files. Most DAWs nowadays have this feature, but back then it was still new and being iterated on. FluxTime was one of the better algorithms for elastic audio in my opinion, second only to Ableton's complex stretch. Sadly, SoundDiver, which was arguably one of the world's most popular synthesizer libraries, was dropped during this version. My guess as to why this happened was that Apple was trying to bundle many stock synthesizers and instruments into Logic to eliminate the need for external libraries. Apple has been known to try and give a full experience with their software and hardware without any need to download external programs or attachments, so you have a very locked in experience. This is both good and bad, but it did most certainly go along with Apple's vision of having Logic be an extension of yourself, easy to use, and no fuss with downloading third-party programs. This version would also be the last to be sold in a hard copy format on DVD. By this time, many programs were moving to a downloadable only format. FL Studio did this previously as well as Ableton. I do think there is something to say about owning hard copies of things, but the world has decided that is a relic of a time gone by. Something I haven't seen Apple do though is lower prices of their products like they did with Logic 9. They reduced the price from $4.99 to $1.99 which makes Logic a real competitor to its peers in price. I think the two to $300 mark is where people start to consider whether or not it's worth it to purchase, and it made Logic far more accessible to bedroom producers, which I think is a great thing. After this version, Apple would discontinue their nice and orderly naming scheme and do what Apple does, which is be different. On July 16th, 2013, Logic Pro X was released. This version was a major overhaul visually and internally. The interface was modeled closely after Final Cut Pro, which is Apple's video editing suite. FlexTime's twin, FlexPitch, was added as well to edit the pitch of a WAV file along with quantization. Apple also added something called Smart Controls, which was a convenient way to map on parameters of a plugin to a single interface. Imagine a Stream Deck, except a digital version of that controls a plugin. A load of instrument and effect plugins were redesigned to match the aesthetic of Logic's new look. The playlist also got some nice upgrades. You are now able to group tracks together and collapse them like a folder to better organize your project. Soloing, muting, and volume could be controlled by a group instead of on individual tracks. One weird thing that got introduced was the Logic Remote. Since Apple already has an abundance of products that work in tandem, your iPad could now be used as a touchscreen instrument or as a remote to navigate within Logic, like mixing or making playlist edits. I think this is something Apple has gotten down to a science, linking together their products in ways that make each easier to use or offer additional ways to accomplish something is one thing Logic's competitors sorely need. Logic Remote was generally received well by producers who used it, although if you wanted that feature, the price of a new iPad might not be worth it exclusively for that purpose, but if you already have an iPad, it's a welcome addition. After Logic Pro X was released, it kept its namesake all the way up until 2020 when the X was dropped, and it went back to being named Logic Pro. During the mid and late 2010s, Logic got similar updates to FL Studio and other DAWs, such as new instrument plugins, visual changes, and above all, a lot more features that make producing music easier and faster. One of the best features came in 2016 with version 10.2. This version introduced Alchemy, which is a very powerful sample manipulation synthesizer. Probably one of the best plugins that Logic has to offer in my opinion. Alchemy is basically Harmer from FL Studio, except better and easier to use. I mean just look at these two side by side, Harmer is an absolute mess for newcomers. This is what Apple excels at, making streamlined software for creative minds to get their vision out. And now we arrive in the present day, with Logic being on version 10 for the last 9 years. Logic is a mainstay in the music production industry, and I don't see Apple dropping support for this product anytime soon. I don't personally use it, but I think it's a very capable program and one that's a lot easier to get into than others. Making this video was a total blast for me. I love researching and reading about the stuff that interests me, and I hope this video helps you appreciate Logic and other DAWs for creating some of the best music ever made. Thank you guys for watching, stay safe out there, and I'll see you in the next video.